All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to day two of San Bernard Virtual Clinic 2020. You're gonna do some quick housekeeping and then we'll jump right into presentation so we can stay on time and on target. Uh, so first, some housekeeping notes. Uh, you are being recorded um, and we brought you into this meeting muted. Uh, if you wanna ask a question or alert us to issues, please either use the Slack Virtual Connect 2020 channel or go ahead and uh, throw a question or a note in the Zoom chat. Uh, as usual, we are doing community notes and we've kicked off a community notes. I've pasted that in the Slack channel already. It should be available. So please uh, help us create a record of this event. Um, and Sam Barry abides by a code of conduct and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Franny uh, to, to, to read from that, this one. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. The Samvera community is dedicated to providing a welcoming and positive experience for all its members, whether they're at a formal gathering, in a social setting, or as we are today, taking part in activities online. The Samvera community welcomes participation from people all over the world, and these community members bring with them a wide variety of professional, personal, and social backgrounds. Whatever these may be, we treat colleagues with dignity and respect. Community members communicate primarily in English, though for many of them, this is not their native language. We therefore strive to express ourselves simply and clearly remembering that unnecessary use of jargon and slang will be a barrier to understanding for many of our colleagues. We are sensitive to the fact that the international nature of the community means that we span many different social norms around language and behavior, and we strive to conduct ourselves online and in person in ways that are unlikely to cause offense. Samvera conversations are often information rich and intended to generate discussion and debate. So we discuss ideas from a standpoint of mutual respect and reasoned argument. Community members work together to promote a respectful and safe community. In the event that someone's conduct is a, uh, causing offense or distress, Samvera has a detailed anti-harassment policy which can be applied to address the problem. The first step in dealing with any serious misconduct is to contact a local meeting organizer, uh, the Samvera community helpers, email uh, is uh, connected to this code of conduct, a community member who you trust, or the Samvera steering group membership immediately. Uh, the anti-harassment policy should be consulted for, uh, for fuller details, and that's also, there's a short link on the slide here. Thank you so much. Back to you, David. Thanks, Brady. Oops, going the wrong direction. Sorry about that. Um, just to, to go through the final bit of housekeeping, we'll run for approximately three hours. We'll break around one hour into it for about 20 minutes. Uh, again, we will address questions at the end of each presentation. So go ahead and enter questions in Slack or Zoom chat at any time during the presentation um, and, and we'll read them out. Uh, and we are gonna try to keep a tight schedule. So we'll move at a quick pace. We did have one scheduling change, um, a member of our community uh, was not feeling well, so uh, Bess uh, Sandler's presentation will, uh, will not be taking place this morning. I wanna give a little shout out to my planning committee who I think planned this uh, uh, Sandler Virtual Connect in record time and under odd circumstances. I wanna thank Franny uh, and John and Kevin and Jim and Michael Fine. Thank you all for, for all the work you did. Um, at a normal one, we applaud very loudly, but we'll just applaud virtually. And big snaps for David, too. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. With that, let's go ahead and get started. I think we're kicking it off with um, interinstitutional spikes exploring Elixir with Trey and Michael. Uh, I'm going to need you to stop. There it is. Yep. Uh, let's try that again. All right. Oh, wait. Okay. Everybody see that? All right. Good. Now that we've gotten the normal, has everybody seen that out of the way? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Trey Pendragon. I'm a developer at Princeton uh, here with, uh, well, he can introduce himself. Michael Klein from Northwestern University. So normally this would be the part of the presentation where I'd trick you all into standing up or something, but this venue doesn't really make that happen. Uh, so instead, I'm just going to say 
the goal of this presentation is really to go over something that uh, sort of this process that Northwestern and Princeton went through roughly five or six months ago, where we got together uh, to explore some new technology uh, in a certain way. And the process of exploring that technology is really the focus here. The, the technology in question is Elixir, which is a language similar to Ruby, uh, Phoenix, which is like Rails for Elixir, uh, as well as Elasticsearch, which is uh, other solar, just another search index. Um, the way it sort of started was we had been looking at Elixir a long time, especially me personally, uh, but it's really hard. There's a vast difference between like I'm playing with this thing and somebody's actually working on this together as a team and we're going to ship this product uh, and get something actually working in a good way. Uh, and we knew that our friends at Northwestern were actively working on an Elixir project. They had some things up already for Elasticsearch, uh, which we were interested in at the time, largely because we had come to recognize that every time we spun up a project, it was some Ruby Rails solar thing. And it's a good thing to broaden your horizons. Um, we had a bunch of questions about how these things actually work. So we went to Northwestern, we said, okay, uh, we've got some time uh, and we're going to explore these technologies and it would be really helpful to us if you would sort of mentor us through that process just to kind of give us the tools and so we have some sort of shared understanding of the way everything works. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about Northwestern's motivation for participating in this. Um, for one thing, we had been working at this point with uh, Elixir for a few months um, as our main development tool, um, working on our new uh, repo next generation repository uh, and the ingest interface for it. It seemed like a good opportunity to look up from that for a little bit and see our work through another team's eyes to get some feedback on it, to sanity check ourselves um, in terms of the road we were going down and the tools we were using. Uh, you know, in keeping with Sam Barra's, uh, if you wanna go far, go together. I mean, that, that bug down in the lower left-hand corner of this slide might as well be another bullet point. We were kind of out on our own using uh, tools that none of our institutional partners were using that we knew of uh, just yet. So having another team interested uh, can sort of help us in the long run, obviously with uh, maintenance, shared stuff. Collaboration might lead to shared projects, code and support, or even just feedback. Um, also, there were some process uh, opportunities for us here, despite like us having the Elixir knowledge in the group. Uh, our colleagues at Princeton have a strong history of, uh, you know, working as a distributed team. Uh, they're pretty much, they've, they've been remote before remote was not only cool, but uh, mandated. Um, and they pair a lot more than we had been. Um, using techniques that we wanted to sort of get from them. And also Trey brought it up and was really, you know, he, he asked nicely and, and made it seem really appealing to participate. Um, we decided up front uh, that we wanted to have some goals that were outside the scope of the project we were working on or any immediate project that they were working on that we would start from scratch and build something together. Um, we wrote up a small document explaining what we hope to get out of it um, and what we'd work on and, and how. We decided we wanted to share knowledge gained from our differing work um, in different areas. 
uh, explore some areas of mutual interest, like Trey mentioned, Elasticsearch, Elixir, obviously. Um, it, it veered off into some deployment tools and, and strategies, Docker, uh, and, and sharing some of that stuff. Um, and to create a space within the Samvera community for experimenting with different technologies that, um, you know, Ruby and Rails aren't gonna, you know, be around forever. Um, not everything is suited to every task. Uh, so it, it's good to sort of broaden the base of what the community has to available and to explore. We wanted a, a broad set of goals. We wanted to, to sort of go wide instead of deep on this particular collaboration um, in, a, in a pretty short amount of time. We wanted to take some fixture data and get it indexed into Elasticsearch. We wanted to create a Phoenix application that could search the index that we created. Um, we wanted to have that the front end of that web application use Lux, Princeton's uh, JavaScript design system that's based on the Vue.js uh, package. And we wanted to deploy it as a Mix release. Mix is uh, Elixir's uh, task tool, similar to Rake in, in Ruby. And um, as far as communication is concerned, uh, we organized our work into GitHub projects board in Samvera Labs. Um, there was a lot of conversation as to where to put this code on the first day. Like, should, should we put it in and use GitHub repo with a Princeton fork or a Princeton repo with an NU fork or directly into Samvera Labs? Um, and we ultimately decided on Samvera Labs because we decided that other teams and other people should be able to find and use this without having to go through us. We, would, we didn't wanna be the gatekeepers of this, the, the products of this collaboration, even though we intend to be, be available to talk about it. Um, we wanted it just out there. We set up a private Slack channel for our uh, collaborative discussion. We set up a daily check-in time uh, and, and agreed on a schedule to include going over other teams' commits and talking about what they were doing and how they did it. And all the actual face-to-face -face collaboration was done in shared Zoom sessions. So when we started this process, we sort of we kind of did the impossible, I think, or the thing which you always hate to do, which is that we sort of scheduled out the whole thing uh, up front. Part of this was because uh, Northwestern couldn't be there the entire time uh, for all 10 days that this sprint happened. Uh, they were busy on Monday and Tuesday of both two weeks, and we wanted to make sure that we maximized sort of our interaction as, as much as we could. Um, and I think one thing that I neglected to mention in the past was that we mentioned these groups. Well, let me let me start from the top. So for the first two days, we Princeton was on their own. Uh, and we took that as a good time to really crash course Elixir um, and just sort of, sort of just sort of get our feet underneath us for things like syntax and sort of project organization and what is Phoenix really and how does it relate to Rails and what's a template and what's a, some of the like glossary of terms is just a little bit different and spending a couple of days on our own going through the tutorials that the framework provides and the language provides just made sure that there wouldn't be too many questions later about like, what is that? line of code you just wrote there. Um, and then day three, we all got together for the very first time. Well, mostly at least. And we gave uh, control over to the gigantic Zoom session over to somebody at Northwestern. I think it was Michael, but I don't remember exactly. Uh, and they just, they spun up 
a new Phoenix application. They had done it before and they had a set of practices. Uh, they shared with us their development tool, which they called DevStack, which spins up some dependencies in Docker and things like that, which really sped things up a lot for us, it turned out. Uh, and then at the end of that day, we sort of split into the groups to try to get our goals in order. Uh, and we made sure that each group had people from both teams uh, and that each group had somebody that was really comfortable with that aspect of the code. So we had one group for indexing and one group for JavaScript stuff and one group for uh, like the Phoenix application and searching. And we just made sure uh, that <laughs> uh, we just made sure that all of that uh, worked out. Um, and then we split up. Uh, and then day six and seven, it was just Princeton again. So we finished up some searching work. Uh, days eight and nine, we knew that deployment was going to be moderately difficult. Um, Northwestern had done some deployment before, but it's just a whole new stack. Like how do I ship this thing into production for real? Uh, and our deployment infrastructure is a lot more locally based than Northwestern's. They tend to deploy things off to the cloud and we don't do that very often. So we had to figure out sort of what the best practices around that would be. So we dedicated two whole days to that, uh, which turned out to be almost exactly correct. And then day 10, we just dedicated to a retrospective and wrap up. So Michael sort of mentioned that we do pairing more often. Um, so the process that we brought to this is we do something that uh, we use the Pomodoro method um, named after those little, those little tomato clocks that have a timer on them. And the way this works is uh, the groups get together, one person is designated as a driver, that person shares their screen, uses their development environment, types for 25 minutes uh, while everybody else talks about it um, and sort of helps guide them along that process. Uh, then you take a five minute break, then you switch drivers and repeat. And obviously at some point you go eat lunch or something. Uh, usually we do this with two people, but we did this, each of the groups turned out to be somewhere between three and five, and it actually worked shockingly well. Uh, and I think we were really happy with it. Uh, so after all of this, you don't end up with a shiny, like totally working project at the end of two weeks, uh, but we did end up with a web page. We met all of our goals which is pretty astonishing. Uh, we indexed 100 results from our digital repository. Uh, we had a search box that worked. We had a facet that worked. We had some GitHub auth. JavaScript was, in it, was uh, merged in. The reason we used that design system was just so that we understood what it would take to add some JavaScript to an Elixir project. Uh, and our, we have a little chatbot thing at Princeton that we tell to deploy our stuff and it deploys our stuff and we got that to work for an Elixir project. Plus we got to say, we got to use the header digital collections at North Winston, uh, which is maybe the best thing ever. Uh, so at the end of the process, we did a group retrospective we followed the four L's, there's a link here, uh, but effectively what it does is you go around the group, everybody puts in what they liked about the two weeks, what they learned during the two weeks, uh, what tools or anything else we didn't have for the two weeks is lacked. Longed for is, uh, for us, it largely came out to like things we really wanted to do, but we didn't get a chance to do. Um, in the interest of, time and just sort of 
I don't know, respect for the process. We can't just post the document here, but I wanted to share after, after the whole process, you like take all of the points and you combine them into groups and then talk about the groups. And one of our groups was yay, which is just like uh, excitement. And we were all really excited about the group collaboration we had. We met all of our goals. There was this enthusiasm to contribute and learn. I think the two teams really came together uh, in a way that we were really excited about and felt smooth. Uh, and that cross-institutional mentorship from both sides, it turned out, we, we had gone to ask for Northwestern, but we were actually felt like at Princeton, we were able to provide some, some practices that we do. Um, and every once in a while, Karen Shaw's dogs would show up on Zoom, which is really what this is all about. Uh, just real quick to go over what we got out of the process. We got this shared development infrastructure. Uh, we would not have been able to do this in two weeks without Northwestern around. Uh, we got to collaborate with our colleagues uh, and a partner institution that we are now good friends with. Uh, we got interested in technologies. We've looking for new projects in Elixir now. Uh, there's a group at Princeton that looks at some Elixir code and stuff every week. Uh, and we got real confidence in the stack that we didn't have before. All of our questions about like, how would we do this for real effectively got answered. As far as what we got out of it, um, we got the improved pair programming technique, especially the Pomodoro method. Um, we got a view of some of Princeton's tools uh, that we didn't know about, like a Slack-based deployment bot that's very cool that they have built um, based on an open source bot infrastructure. Um, a sanity check that the work we're doing makes sense to another team. Uh, some thoughts on how we might organize our work to make pieces of it reusable by others. We hadn't really been approaching this development with an eye towards sharing most of our code, but now we have some better ideas of how we can. Um, we learn more about our own tools and services by troubleshooting, uh, trying to deploy uh, this project onto Princeton's uh, cloud infrastructure. And most importantly, the real inter institutional spike was the friends we made along the way. We really enjoyed working with uh, the, the people and, the, and felt that the process really uh, lifted everyone up quite a bit. And finally, uh, what we'd change about it, we wanted more time at the keyboard, less planning, less process, more typing. Um, some smaller groups would have helped, maybe a longer uh, spike with a little more um, done up front to, to establish, to, to require less process handling. We at Northwestern had a bunch of other commitments during that two weeks, um, and we really wish we could have been there for the full second week instead of leaving the Princeton team kind of on their own for it. And we wish we had had uh, time to explore some of the other features like Ecto, which is the active record sort of um, of the uh, Elixir world and the Elasticsearch React user interface. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll get back together and get to some of that stuff. Maybe we'll explore some more of it, um, but it was a great, Way to start. Uh, that's it for us. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have a question here. Um, Trey mentions that the Princeton team is looking to use Elixir actively in a project. I wonder what Trey and Michael think makes for a good Elixir project versus say a good Ruby project. Um, I can only say personally for Princeton, it's like, a, for us, it's a new project is the big requirement, uh, which we don't spin up super often. Um, I think there are some things that really, like if you really need a lot of performance or if you really need like real stability or multi-core parallel processing, uh, Elixir is really good at all of that. Um, but really, for us, it's just a fun new thing. And we're just looking for something to use it with. Yeah, and after working with Elixir for about a year now, um, I think 
The only time I would choose Ruby for something I was starting up from scratch at this point would be if there was um, legacy code that needed to be incorporated that was uh, made in Ruby, or if there was a Ruby library, um, a, a, a piece of uh, stuff that we needed to work with that has native Ruby bindings that nobody had implemented in Elixir yet, and we really needed to, to get up to speed quickly. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, up next, we're going to have a Haiku Racks projects panel, uh, Advancing Haiku, uh, Haiku for Consortia, and Hyrax Analytics leads. So Ellen, Brian, Gretchen, Amanda, and Margaret. And I will stop my share. Thanks, Franny. Um, that's a lot of people in the amount of time that we have. So we have, of course, way too many slides, um, but I'm going to share them. And I also put them in the chat um, here and in Slack. So you can, um, at your leisure, go through um, the slides that we're sharing today. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we so can. see a screen for a Haiku Racks panel. Um, and um, uh, the point of this panel today is that um, these three projects are going on kind of concurrently. And one of the things that happens um, with grant funded projects is that uh, the grants are all due sort of around the same time and there's not always as much conversation um, among projects before things are submitted. So um, we've got a lot of things to share um, among these three projects and we've started some conversations. We wanted to give a little background on the three projects um, and then um, have some time for questions and to talk a little bit about how we plan to collaborate and how we've started collaborating. So I'm gonna give you a little background on the Advancing Haiku project. Um, this is probably familiar to folks who have been in the Samvera Partners meetings. Um, these are similar slides to what we did there. Uh, there's much more information on the project um, on the Advancing Haiku um, public information site that URL is listed there. But the point of this is uh, to advance the work that uh, Stanford and the Haiku community had done on this project um, to um, support the institutional repository features of this particular tool. Um, uh, we really liked uh, the approach of what it is not. I won't read this to you, um, but you can um, read it yourselves. Um, but the takeaway is that we don't think we're the be all end all answer uh, to all institutional repository challenges um, or that population and use are the way necessarily to solve open access problems, but it is a way. Um, and I will emphasize that uh, contribution back of code um, is very, very important to the project. And it's um, a, always a challenge, but um, something that we are committed to doing. Things that we do hope to achieve. Um, again, not new. I won't read them to you. Things that we do hope to deliver, um, and to this, I was just reading this just before the presentation, and to this list, I would also add um, some of the very important work um, that uh, Gretchen's gonna talk about um, in terms of multi-tenant um, work that's already been done by British Library and contributing that back, and she'll talk a little bit more about that collaboration. Um, but things that are happening now, um, I would also add to this, um, the um, architecture review that British Library is contributing to this project um, is just about to be released. There will be a public report on that quite soon. We were talking about that this morning. Um, I know you all like eye charts. So here is the latest iteration of the Advancing Haiku Roadmap. And you can see sort of where we are, where we think we're going to be. Um, if you have a sharp eye and um, can um, compare the timeline of this um, to what I said at the beginning, you'll notice that we're a little bit over at the end. And as are many projects, um, I think that we will probably be looking to uh, an extension, but we haven't quite worked on that yet. I'm going to turn it to Gretchen and Amanda. 
Hi, I'm Gretchen Gigan from Palsy, and uh, my colleague Amanda from Palmy is here as well. You can go ahead to the next slide. Hi, hey, everyone. Amanda. Oh, thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Herford, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Director for Palney. Um, and we thought it'd be a good idea to kick off our portion of this presentation by showing you our shared values for a collaborative institutional repository. So Palney has been searching for a suitable collaborative IR solution since about 2012, way before I started working with Palney. And um, when I came on, I decided um, that a good place to start would to be to start a vision, thinking about what do we want um, in such a system. So I won't read all of these to you, but these have really become our shared values for this project and been the guiding principles in our search um, for a suitable platform. So since we were unable to find an existing solution that does all of these things and satisfies all of these values, um, Palni embarked on a development project with Palsy to optimize Haiku for consortial use. Next slide. So yeah, Palsy and Palni had both been working on um, the problem from different aspects. Palsy had been part of the Haiku Direct Grant, um, testing out uh, Haiku back in 2017. Um, so based on the shared interest and based on actually a lot of interest from the ICOLT, the International Coalition of Library Consortia, uh, sorry, that's a long acronym, um, and a lot of their interest in a multi-tenant IR solution, um, we worked together starting in 2018 on a, a self-funded uh, pilot working with Notch 8. Um, and we stood up Haiku and we tested the basic functionality and features. I um, mean, really actually Amanda did this work. I was not yet with Palsy at this point. Um, and, and out of that basically decided that Haiku was the most viable option, but we needed to do some more work to make it work for us. So we got a grant from IMLS and started last year um, working on building out some of those features. So the next slide. <clears throat> So uh, the features that we're going to be working on um, include a lot of work to make a Haiku uh, function better for multi-tenant work. So um, we put something big in the grant called collaborative workflow support. And what we've realized that means is um, better uh, ability to assign user permissions from the consortium level to so to be able to control and assign permissions across all of the tenants so that they can share users um, who maybe want to two institutions want to work together and have an editorial board or, or something like that, or someone from the consortium consortia is going to help out the tenant and do different works. So that's going to involve actually decoupling groups from roles um, to allow us to do more fine grain assignment of permissions. We've also started working on um, theme sort of templates, theme in the WordPress sense, so different, different kind of out of the box UI designs um, for our different tenants to be able to distinguish themselves and pick something that kind of goes along with their institutional brand. And we're specifically building some that are IR focused and so they'll have like a big submit button um, and some that are more collections focused and in particular at least one that is very open education resource focused because we're developing both ETD and OER work types. We've already developed the OER work type um, with some very customized metadata with a lot of um, fields from the learning resource community. And we're also implementing some front end features that'll support those like commenting, which is very important in the OER um, community. So on the next slide, um, I'll talk about some of the other features that we haven't really started working on yet, but we will be. Um, so one of them is, is uh, DOI integration, and we're really not sure exactly what we're doing there. Um, I think this will be a big area of overlap with um, work that uh, British Library and UVA are doing. Um, as well as cross-tenant searching. That's something that um, has been developed in a previous project with British Library. We'd like to take advantage of that. Um, we've talked about things like multi-tenant works, works that could be shared between the tenants for things like coordinated collaborative exhibits. Um, and we're also, uh, so, so as part of that, we're really also sharing with the, the community. We wanna share code back. Um, we also wanna reuse new contributions from other projects. Um, which is where this kind of integration all comes together. So next slide. So I'll um, do our last slide here, which is our timeline and next steps. Um, so we've already completed our kickoff and initial, initial project planning for our um, IMLS grants, and we've gathered our first round of specifications from our product management team for collaborative workflows and theming and branding. 
and the process of defining requirements for other features will continue as we work through those other areas. Um, we've recently started our development cycle with Notch 8 for collaborative workflows, and we're doing lots for that. And we plan to continue um, that through September and hopefully beyond because we too are planning to apply for an extension with our grant. Um, and lastly, um, we'll test this out and get some feedback from our consortial participants and our respective directors from Palmi and Palsi will have a chance to think about how to govern this type of service um, to our and provide it out to our consortial members and perhaps beyond. Um, so that's going to be probably one of the last things that um, get addressed as part of this project. And I think that's it for Haiku for Consortia. Great. Thank you, Gretchen and Amanda. We're going to move on to Hyrex Analytics. And Margaret, uh, Franny's also on this presentation, but uh, she is ex officio in her current role. Right. Hello, I'm Margaret Mellinger, and uh, Franny and I are the co-PIs on this um, Hyrax Analytics grant for IMLS. Um, as everyone knows, analytics is a long desired feature for Hyrax, um, and the gap analysis showed that that was one of the things that was stopping other uh, repositories from considering using the platform. So next slide, slide please. So I just wanted to give a brief history. Um, way back in 2016, which seems even longer ago in the pre-COVID-19 times, a working group was formed by Steve Van Tile and many other wonderful people to begin defining what analytics could look like in Hyrax. Analytics was placed on the Hyrax roadmap and in concert with that, the working group developed user stories, use cases, definition of terms, and they began to flesh out some requirements. However, with a long list of development priorities in Hyrax and limited resourcing, analytics did not become a major development effort at that time. So in recognition of the lack of bandwidth, it was taken off the Hyrax roadmap. Next slide, please. So taking analytics off the Hyrax roadmap did not mean that the need had disappeared, obviously. Um, as part of uh, the migration of our joint repository, Oregon Digital, uh, joint between OSU and University of Oregon. Um, we we're moving from Hydra to Hyrax. We discussed how various features might be developed for Hyrax as a whole that would benefit our local needs. So um, our, our two institutions uh, got together and submitted a proposal to the IMLS based on the strong foundation that was uh, laid by that Hyrax analytics working group. And the grant was awarded in 2019. Um, next slide, please. So um, given staff attrition and other organizational challenges, we've needed to shift the timeline of this grant as well to allow us yet another year for development. Our RFP is coming out pretty soon. Um, to the extent possible at this time, we are coordinating with the other two projects previously described in this presentation. And we're optimistic that our community will be successful in meeting the challenges presented in developing analytics functionality that meets the needs of many. Thanks for your time. And um, I think we're ready for discussion. We are, we are up to questions. I'm gonna stop my sh uh, presentation, I think, so that I can see the chat. Um, and um, one person who is, uh, joining us at this point, actually, I'm just going to stop my share, um, should be Brian um, Hole from Ubiquity Press, and I see him online, and he should be able to help us answer questions. So um, I'm going to cede a question to all of you first, um, which is, does anybody want to talk more about the collaborations um, that the three projects have begun? And, um, and then we can start taking questions. Well, I guess I could start and say um, by thanking Ellen um, for <laughs> the meeting that we were able to bring everyone together to have some initial conversations. We've had a couple of meetings so far to try to see where everybody is in the process and also just to um, set that groundwork for communication between these three big projects. And I would add to that um, with the analytics project um, that there's real work that's being done in both projects that's going to save us some time. Um, and so, you know, the collaboration, particularly with that aspect, um, we focused on um, external facing um, analytics on one end and then um, author facing analytics on the other project. And I 
um, I think that that will be a really good division. Okay. I think it's uh, the fact that um, the uh, UVA British Library Ubiquity Grant is focusing on a lot of IR features kind of has helped us out in freeing us up to really be able to focus on just the consortia features that that's the unique um, thing we can we can bring to this. I know, you know, back in the early days of developing Haiku, multi tenant installation was one of the really big things we knew we had to we had to do that the point of this of making a turnkey solution was that it's available to the you know consortia to be able to run for themselves and to free them from having to um, you know be part of um, what has you know at that time wasn't even the the, the Brexit yet but that's really um, kind of influenced us so uh, we're really looking forward to hopefully being able to um, be greedy and use the contributions <laughs> that the other two products are using but hopefully are things like especially I think the themes um, may be very useful to their projects as well. Yeah. Brian, do you want to say a little bit about um, the work that Ubiquity has done on a couple of these projects or you know where where the alignments are that you see? Um, well, Ubiquity has already worked with the British Library to introduce a lot of multi-tenant um, multi, um, functionality into the system. Um, and we're working now to sort of make that more scalable. Um, I think that will align really, really well with um, the work that Palmi and Palsy are doing. Um, and we'll have to, of course, make sure as we feed the code back that that's um, done in close consultation. Um, and the metrics work we're doing in advancing Haiku um, is very well aligned, of course, with the OSU work. Um, and uh, it's also very uh, timely for Ubiquity because we're building a sort of a, um, a self-service reporting solution at, into Haiku at the moment. And we'll, we'll, of course, work very closely with, with, um, with that project as well. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, and um, moderators, please let me know how much time we have or if we are over. Um, I was having trouble seeing the chat while presenting in full screen. I think we've got about five minutes. Thanks, Franny. Um, I'm not seeing questions in the chat. I will check Slack. Did we overwhelm you with all that information? All right, so barring questions from the audience, are there highlights that any of the panelists would like to bring forward? Um, I, I would say that um, I, I, I picked up the comment just now about the Brexit and, and things, and um, I think it's very, very salient. And um, so we've had the first um, haiku migration from um, uh, the Digital Commons platform recently at Pacific University, if anyone wants to go and have a look at that and see how Haiku is when it's, when it's implemented. Um, it's, you know, I think it was very successful and I think we're in a good position um, with the platform now to do many, many more such migrations um, in the, the B Brexit world. I just had one other thing to mention. Um, as far as the two Haiku projects, we've been able to talk regularly at the Haiku interest group meeting, which has been really successful and helpful in kind of updating each other and learning about um, what are some ways where we might be overlapping or you know learn about what we might want to talk more about offline. And I just wanted to say thanks to Kevin and others at Notchate who have been helpful in getting that coordinated and everyone who goes to those meetings. So I'm glad that that exists as a way for us to get on the same page. Yeah, and I see some nice comments in the Slack channel. Um, and oh, I see a question. Hooray. Oh, <laughs> it was just a thank you. And that's what I'm seeing um, in the Slack channel as well. Thanks to Mark, Mike Jarlow um, for taking, for saying thank you. Thank you, thanking us for taking Haiku forward. Uh, John Dunn is saying thanks for the collaboration. 
Um, Hannah asks, do we have a link to the Pacific University haiku instance? Um, and our um, developer from Ubiquity Press, Bertie Wools, just put that link into the chat. So um, I'm pleased to see that. And we'll keep this going um, in the virtual connect chat. Yes. And Hannah, you can probably, um, I, I believe it, we probably have an entry for that. And if we don't, we should on the haiku, um, haiku interest groups wiki where we're keeping track of projects. Um, so you can see all the haiku projects there if, if you'd like. Great. And Gretchen, if you can add that to the virtual connect Slack. Oh, she's got, Hannah's got it. Hannah can put it up since she's right there. All right. Um, I any other questions? I'm going to check one last time. Um, looks good. So we will um, wrap up our session, but you know where to find us all. <laughs> Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ellen and everybody. All right. So we can use that little bit of time to get set up for our next talk right before the break here. And that is going to be uh, creating JavaScript components to provide rich user experiences for uh, search and browse. So uh, Chris and Rodrigo. Thank you. We can see your screen. <laughs> Great. I'm going to skip the question. Um, hello, everyone. I am Chris Colvard, a developer at Indian University uh, working on Avalon. Hi, I am Rodrigo. Um, I am system librarian at the Colegio de Mexico. And we have currently adopted Harax as our institutional repository. So uh, today, um, we've already seen some presentations yesterday about um, using JavaScript components. And so as these are becoming more common in the community, we wanted to share our two experiences, our two stories about developing JavaScript components for uh, search and browse. So we'll talk about our use cases, um, the, solutions, the solutions we came up with, uh, next steps, and the lessons we learned. Well. Um, I'm going to describe the problem we are trying to solve using GS components at El Colegio de Mexico. Um, we constantly develop digital exhibition based on the Omeka or WordPress platform. This means that there are many platforms each supported by virtual server. Uh, this it implies consumption of this space, bandwidth, and processor cycles. In addition, to present redundancy in the file they host. For Avalon, collections had been a kind of administrative internal thing, uh, really kind of only granting permissions for collection staff to ingest content. And we really wanted a way for end users to, um, to, to see more than just a label and a facet and to really have a stronger understanding of the collection, um, giving them some details, contact information, um, you know, a way to, to look at the contents of it um, within the uh, context of a collection. Uh, well, uh, we have established a, a few requirements to the GS component Move Me R. Um, the first, they must be able to harvest but the concentrated information from our repository. We try to centralize all information of our Omeka into Hirax. And they, they harvest must be from the client machine. This implies that there, that there will be no intermediate stage that consults the repository and generates the render for the client. The harvesting is from the client directly. Um, they must be easily integrated into any web portal or CMS platform. They must be highly adaptable in terms of design and visual style. And for Avalon, we wanted to place, as I said, we wanted to place the user within the context of a collection and um, have it be uh, inviting and simple, um, an interface that's very you know, visual and dynamic. We, will, we really wanted to draw the user in um, to this 
point of view of the collection. Um, so we wanted to have users be able to um, kind of filter and browse the collection's contents um, you know, outside of the context of the, the normal um, kind of black light monolithic uh, fast food search. And this, throughout all this, we wanted to make sure that we're still applying gated discovery um, specific to, to the collections. Well, um, what is our, our solution? Um, the development that we work has a solution involves a series of components that are independent of each other. So depending on the need, we can apply one or more depending on the case. This, this is an image from our components. We separate every, every every single component from black light and we can consult uh, separately and are, and are independent from each other. As Avalon, we implemented uh, two separate pages. Um, on the left is a filter and browse of collections um, that only shows collections that a user has access to um, this is defined by if they, if the user is able to access at least one of the items within the collection. So we implemented this with a, a solar join query. Um, on the right side um, is the collection landing page. That's what we're calling it. This is the context of one collection. And um, you'll see that it has filtering of the um, collections items, uh, kind of pagination there. And, um, we iterated on this design and we decided to not include facets at this place at this point, um, but in, to, to simplify the, the layout. Instead, underneath the um, kind of thumbnail that's missing for this collection, there's a link out to the normal blacklight search with the filter applied or with a facet applied to this collection for more complex searching there. Um, well, um... We choose to carry out the development with the progressive framework Vue.js. This is mainly because it allows to use this the, of the, the simple EIS5 JavaScript. Since there are multiple junior developers in the different units of the El Colegio de Mexico, we decide to avoid the code transpilation process. Uh, as a result, we can quickly develop sites using CMS technology or make a simple HTML layout and integrate the components. Avalon, uh, we built our components using React. That was um, what we'd already been working with and what there is some experience on the team. Um, we started with uh, Blacklight View um, as kind of like a starting point and inspiration. So thanks, Justin Coyne, for sharing that. And we integrated it within our Rails app using React Rails. Um, these uh, these components, as you said, are you know dynamic. They they filter um, results on the fly by um, making requests to um, Blacklight's JSON um, endpoint and then um, kind of you know rendering the results through through the component. Um, and so, uh, um, these components just provide a new. Um, and different uh, user interface that gets used. It's not replacing our blacklight search. Um, it's just kind of a different thing in a different context. Well, what is the next in, in this development? Um, we consider facilitating CA, CSS customization even more. We currently use Bootstrap, but we consider that it's not easy and quick enough to customize for GS developers. And we have another idea uh, for a long term is they develop uh, components that allow to use uh, to, that allows use to reuse the information hosted on in IRAX for research purpose. For example, use uh, or create a corpus, uh, word clouds, map and time lamps, uh, tools from the digital humanities, for example. Possible next steps for Avalon. Um, 
include you know, cleaning up and refining packaging these components for embedding on sites outside of Avalon, um, like collection homepages, just to be similar to what uh, Rodrigo is doing now. Um, and these components are just kind of part of our kind of current trajectory to increasing the use of JavaScript components um, within Avalon. Um, and since they, they only rely on uh, Blacklight JSON results, um, they should be pretty easy to bring over to Avalon Bundle when we make the switch to a, a Hyrax based Avalon. So kind of reflecting on our two experiences, we were wondering um, if this really kind of changes the way that we approach um, and think about uh, designing our Rails applications and how we might approach uh, future projects. So we've learned how um, these kind of contained reusable JavaScript components, make building these uh, exhibit sites or integrations with um, uh, other uh, external sites makes it a lot easier, as well as kind of decoupling the UI from the back end gives us um, kind of gives us a new environment or the setup for, for building cleaner application code being you know, delivered about the APIs that we are writing um, and allowing for more reuse within that um, because we're being intentional about our APIs. But the question arising um, th that I'm thinking about is, you know, is this the time, does it make sense now to build a shared set of uh, some very JavaScript components. You know, we're looking at search and browse here, and that's a common use case for all of us. Um, maybe we can develop something collaboratively that um, you know, is shareable and reusable and adaptable to our different um, contexts, um, but which uh, can you know, bring us into a modern UIs with, uh, with these JavaScript components. And that's all. So, um, Thank you uh, for your time. We have links here to our GitHub repositories and um, ways to contact us. Thanks for your attention. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question here in the chat. Uh, have you used or looked at things like Elasticsearch UI or AppBase's reactive components? And if so, it is not on uh, We're getting a background noise there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well, I'm first. Um, uh, no, I don't know about Elasticsearch UE or Apex. Um, we want to use Vue.js because it's very likely. Uh, it's very weightless for the for the client. It's very speed up. Um, we try to avoid TypeScript and another forms of JavaScript. Because the transpilation process is complex for or other developers at the Colegio de Mexico. El Col. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, um, I, I think I've seen some of those. We haven't um, really looked deeply into them. Um, this was for for uh, us on Avalon. These two components for or these sets of components were really a way for. Um, developers, including myself, who weren't really familiar with React to kind of dip our toes in and um, get mentorship from those who were more um, uh, experienced. And so we really kind of, we're slowly building our own. Um, I think we'd want to go back and look at what um, is available uh, as pre-built components, but I'm kind of wondering if, if still we might end up with our own um, and, and again, like whether the community wants to collaboratively work on building these. Great, there was a second question here, um, maybe related about the overhead of using, uh, overhead for the client browser of using uh, JavaScript instead of the backend server. That's a good question. I don't think we've had, any issues with that? I think we actually, um, because we're not rendering a full page um, from the Rails backend, but rather just fetching these JSON results, um, I, th I think we've seen you know, better performance and a better user experience. Um, thank you Nope, 
Okay. Well, um, I think we are at uh, time for our break right now. So we're going to have about a 20 minute break and we will resume at uh, 1220 Eastern Daylight Time, uh, 920 Pacific. So we will see you all uh, in a little bit and we will resume with uh, enhanced preservation fewer migrations. Did I get that right? No, we're resuming with working groups. I lied. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And half of the things that, um, you know, the lead guy was saying, hey, Franny, good morning, how are you? Franny, I believe your mic's open.
All right, we're just about coming up on time. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, we're about ready to roll into um, working groups and interest groups uh, for the session. The, the first one up, I'll, I'll roll through the slides for those uh, participating. The first one we'll, we'll do is the Sambera Code of Conduct, the Sambera Code of Conduct Working Group. I believe that's you, Jessica. Hello. Um, so the Samvera Code of Conduct Working Group, um, you may remember last year we uh, redid uh, a bit of the Code of Conduct to um, help with procedures around any Code of Conduct violations. And we have made a list of recommendations to partners on what we want to do going forward. Um, and we will wait for partners to make a decision about it. We are not currently meeting, um, however, once partners has decided um, about the direction that we're gonna go with the code of conduct, we will need a committee uh, up and running uh, surrounding code of conduct. So if you're interested and you wanna be part of shaping the code of conduct for Sam Vera, uh, you can contact me. Uh, it's jessica at ucsd.edu, or you can just find me on Slack, Jessica Hilt, um, or take a look at our charter and all my contact information is there. And that, is about it. Gosh, that's a minute. Would you like me to sing? I could sing for the rest of the four minutes or tell jokes. Oh, these can be short. It's okay. Just okay. Yeah, I can we'll do... probably use your time. <laughs> but I pass it on to Robin. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. So yeah, I didn't know if you wanted me to show slides or not, but it might be um better because I've got a couple of models to show. That's okay. Sure, I'll stop sharing. Go, go ahead. Okay, Ellen. great. Okay. All right. Okay, so can everybody see this? Hello? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, a couple of years ago, the governance working group charged us, charged the group to come up with a contribution model. And basically um, the governance group had worked with the partnership and they decided that rather than the ad hoc funding that an in-kind time that we had been running on was not gonna be sufficient to do what the partnership wanted in terms of hiring a full-time community manager and a full-time technical coordinator. So that's why we got together. Um, the first thing we did was we analyzed, you know, what we needed to satisfy in terms of all the different people, all the different parties that work with the community. So um, we've determined that one size was not gonna fit all. So we have academic nonprofit or similar types of institutions. And that's what most of the community is made up of. Then we have service providers that have different needs um, and service in different ways. And then we also knew that not everyone is going to be able to predict what their financial situation is gonna be. And, we had no idea that when we were going to roll this out that we were going to be in the middle of a pandemic, but there you are. So we knew we had to um, think about discounts and what that would look like. And we decided that the request for discounts would have to be based on financial need. Um, we wanted to stress to people that we do value all of the in-kind contributions and that would be taken into consideration but that any kind of discount that we would give to an institution would have to be evaluated and approved by steering. So the first model was for the academic nonprofits and similar institutions. And based on what JSTOR has done in the past, we decided that that was probably the best uh, model to leverage. And then that's classifying institutions based on basically their budget. And so they would be based between very small and very large or sustaining. And we went ahead and mapped out um, the different minimum contributions and also 
just sort of gave a view as to what the 25% discount would look like for each of those different levels. Then for service providers, we wanted to base that on hours billed. And all, both of these models, we went back and forth with different people discussing and basically from 2018 through now, or through last the end of last June really, uh, was when the bulk of this work was done. So there was a lot of conversation with a lot of different kinds of members of the community to come up and vet these kind of models. So we decided it's gonna be implemented over two years beginning now. So we're right now sending out bills, invoices to institutions, but with the note of, we understand that people's budgets were decided last fall. Almost all academic institutions, you know, have to prepare ahead for fiscal years. So the budget that people have right now might not accommodate paying for that invoice. So we wanted to give a two year start billing now. And then in 2020, expect the partnerships to pay according to where they fall in the contribution model. We also wanted the community to do a periodic review and update of the benefits of partnership. And I'll post the slides, but that's a link to the benefits of partnership um, that the communities had and reviewed and updated. And for supporters, which is another kind of entity within the uh, community, if you will, we wanted, it's very really important for the kind of in-kind or financial support that they give us. Um, and a good example of that is for Sanvera Connect 2019. That was supported by DCE, EBSCO, Notch 8, Red Hat, and Ubiquity. And if there's anybody I missed, I apologize. Um, but we didn't really have any kind of uh, sponsor benefits, you know, that had been written down. And so we've also asked the community to come up and develop those and periodically review and revise those just as we do the other benefits for partnership. I wanted to thank everybody who has uh, worked through the two phases of this, May through September in 2018, February through June 2019. And the reason I wanted to put these dates up is right now we're sort of in a holding pattern seeing how um, institutions respond to the contribution models. And so we haven't sunsetted or finished off this working group because we still feel like there's a little bit of work that we need to do, presenting, getting the word out, um, taking suggestions that people have, solving problems as they crop up. So all of these people have been involved. And that's where we are. And that's basically all I have. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Robin. Sorry, I don't uh, know how many minutes I took. Oh, no, it's okay. We'll, if we can take questions uh, offline and not synchronously, um, yes. just to, to be able to move through those. All right, thanks. All right, and next up is, oops, the Sambera Roadmap Council. Oh, and I don't believe Rob is online. I don't believe so. So actually we're gonna go ahead and skip over that one. Unless there's someone else from the Roadmap Council that can jump in and give a quick update. I don't believe so. Okay, we'll jump to the Sambera Marketing Working Group. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, Thanks, Chris. Uh, just to, on the screen, I've just put the summary of uh, when the marketing working group meets, uh, which is every fortnight uh, at 11.30 Eastern time. Uh, and we have our wiki page, which is where, it's where we try and endeavor to keep up to date with what uh, ongoing work. Um, I'd like to give a big thank and thank you to all the members of the group who have uh, helped take uh, our discussions forward um, over the uh, past um, few months, particularly. Um, and uh, just to reflect on what we have been doing over the last few months is essentially to review the website, the Sambira website. 
uh, which is the main, in a sense, front window of Samvera and the community uh, to anyone out there in looking to find out more about Samvera in many ways. Uh, we wanted to refresh the language, update the language. We were conscious that some of the language was quite internal. It was focused on what um, uh, people in the community might have expected to read rather than necessarily those people outside the community. So we tried to address that to some extent. We're always conscious that we could continue to improve it. So if you do see anything that strikes you as odd or feels that uh, looks like it could be improved, then do please uh, let us know uh, because we want it to be as good as it can be to out anyone out there coming across Sambira for the first time. Uh, one of the main uh, things we did alongside that was to build in the use of the vision that the Sambira partners um, agreed at uh, Connect um, last October. Uh, so that is now first and foremost on the front of the website. Uh, we have also built the uh, vision into the latest version of the Samvira leaflet, uh, which is available on the wiki uh, for download and use and printing and use as you would like to use it um, at any events, internal or external, that you happen to be going to. Please do make use of it. Um, uh, where it's uh, useful, uh, we can also, uh, we do have a stock of um, stickers uh, representing different parts of the Sambira uh, community, uh, Sambira itself, but also the associated Hyrax and Haiku uh, initiatives. Um, and for larger events, we also have a tablecloth, uh, which could be used to, uh, to um, for a table or a stand that you may have at such an event. Uh, if you do um, have an opportunity to do that, and would like to be able to make use of those for, um, materials, then do, again, please let us know. Uh, looking ahead, we are planning to uh, explore further how we can take the generic marketing that we've got now available to us and see how we can differentiate that for different audiences. We do have that to some extent in the way that some of the pages are geared on the website and in the wiki, of course, uh, but we want to try and uh, bring that back out and be more proactive in what we can provide uh, to help you communicate what Sambira can offer to the different audiences that you work with, um, either in your institution or indeed outside it as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Next up is the Control Vocabulary's Decision Tree Working Group with Julie. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Julie Hardesty. I'm uh, with Indiana University Libraries, and I am facilitating the Controlled Vocabularies Decision Tree Working Group. And uh, this working group is interested in providing guidance for selecting and using controlled vocabularies behind descriptive metadata fields. Uh, this guidance will be useful within Hyrax and other software incorporating metadata fields that could benefit from controlled terms for consistency and accuracy. Uh, and this is a working group um, that's part of the Samvera Metadata Interest Group. Um, so we meet every two weeks, and our next meeting is uh, Wednesday, May 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we're aiming for generally useful deliverables uh, with examples and instructions that are specific to uh, Hyrax and Haiku. So um, we're wanting to uh, provide um, defined use cases for when controlled vocabularies are, are potentially useful. Um, we want to identify sources and steps for actually locating controlled vocabularies out in the world. Um, and also uh, providing some, some possibilities for how to evaluate a controlled vocabulary and figure out if it's a good fit for uh, what your needs are. Uh, and then uh, getting into the Hyrax and Haiku specific information, um, identifying steps and connecting and uh, ex exposing documentation for how to actually add a controlled vocabulary uh, to Hyrax. So um, the working group is aiming to complete this work by Sam Vericonnect in October this year. And uh, that is our update. Thanks, Julie. And I believe that's it for the uh, for the working groups. Someone else seems to be moving this up. Um, so we're going to stop sc screen sharing here and jump back into uh, the next presentation, which is, sorry, one moment, please. The next presentation uh, is enhanced Preservation, Fewer Migrations, Fedora 6, and the Oxford Common File Layout.
Hi, yeah, that one's mine. Let me just share my screen here. And we're a little ahead of time too, so feel free to take your time. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. Just let me know if not, but I'll uh, otherwise proceed here. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is David Wilcox. I'm the program leader for Fedora at Lyricis. Um, I just want to provide a brief update on what's going on with Fedora 6, which is the next major version of Fedora that we're working on. Uh, along with that, um, a brief introduction as well to the, uh, to the Oxford common file layout. So in thinking about Fedora 6, uh, we had a few high level goals um, and, and these are, uh, they're kind of summarized here. I, I think primarily, uh, and this is related to work we did last year with the um, IMLS grant funded work around uh, designing migration path, uh, just recognizing that a lot of the uh, Fedora community is still using uh, earlier versions of Fedora, particularly version three, um, and that uh, a lot of the reasons for not moving ahead to version four or five have to do uh, on the one hand with the level of effort that was required to migrate, uh, and on the other hand, the, the perception of um, not enough value uh, in terms of the features of the platform to make that effort uh, worthwhile. So a lot of the work around Fedora 6 is trying to address uh, those concerns in particular, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, how we're reducing the effort and uh, what kind of value we're adding in terms of enhancing some of the long-term digital preservation features of Fedora. Um, but then another issue that came up, uh, particularly in the Sambera community, actually around versions four and five, um, had to do with some very particular performance and scale issues that uh, uh, are encountered under certain uh, circumstances when, when using uh, Fedora 4 and Fedora 5. So um, in, uh, we're addressing kind of all three of those um, uh, high level concerns with, uh, with this next version. In terms of the process, there's a, there are a few things that we're doing here. So uh, some of you that have been in the community for a while may uh, recall that Fedora 4 and 5 is based on uh, mode shape, which is itself uh, an open source uh, repository platform that uh, in recent years has uh, uh, just become less and less active in terms of uh, its own community uh, and actually ended up being the source of many of the issues that we ran into in recent years, particularly with regard to the performance and scale uh, issues. So one of the first things that we've done, and, and this is already complete, is, is to uh, replace the mode shape component of Fedora uh, and then underneath the, uh, the API to implement the, uh, the Oxford common file layout, which I'll, I'll talk about here next. Um, but crucially, the, the, the thing what we're doing is, is to retain alignment with the current uh, Fedora API, uh, which is good news for anyone who is uh, using an application that is built on top of Fedora 4 or 5, because the API in version 6 really isn't going to change, or at least won't change significantly. Um, it'll just be sort of a, a change to the underlying uh, persistence layer um, beneath that, uh, that API. Uh, and, and as well, we're, we're really committed to releasing uh, the uh, version six with uh, really robust migration tooling and, and support. And that's something that we're kind of working on uh, in tandem as we, as we develop this next version. So before I give an update on sort of where we are in the development process, I thought it'd be useful to talk uh, a little bit here about what the Oxford Common File layout is. Uh, and, and this is uh, just a fairly brief overview um, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, specification. Um, so at a high level, uh, you can think of the OCFL as a, a simple, non-proprietary, specified, open standards approach to the layout of preservation persistence. And there's a lot packed into there. So over the next few slides, I'll sort of unpack that uh, a little bit. But, but really the OCFL is a, it's a specification, it's, it's a standard, um, and it's not really about file systems. It's really just about how you lay out your content on whatever your storage media happens to be. So there, there's a lot of things that I think the OCFL offers. Um, these are sort of the main ones. And in the following slides, I'll, I'll go into each of these in, in a little bit more detail. But I think um, certainly what it, what it provides are things like uh, parsability and robustness, uh, versioning, storage diversity, and, and completeness. So I'll, I'll talk about each of these in turn. Um, so by parsability, what I mean is by both uh, humans and machines. So making sure that content can be understood in the absence of the original software. And on the right there is just a really brief snapshot of uh, what a, a sample OCFL object might look like. Um, but the idea here is that, uh, particularly in disaster recovery situations where you might not have 
uh, access to the uh, application that uh, sits on top of your data that um, a, a human using fairly basic file system tools should be able to uh, still understand and make sense of that content on disk. So it's not sort of locked into some proprietary database schema or anything like that. Um, and on the other side, it's also machine readable. So uh, you could take a fairly simple client and there are some of these that already exist uh, that understands the OCFL and drop that on top of the storage route uh, and be able to um, comprehend, uh, make sense of the, uh, the data um, underneath from a machine perspective as well. Uh, by robustness here, I'm talking about uh, robustness against errors and corruption, uh, as well as migration between different storage technologies. So uh, there is a strong sense of fixity built into the OCFL, so using checksums. Um, and you can always validate the content that's stored in this structure um, using the in inventory files. Um, and all of the objects that are stored using the standard really are intended to be self-contained. So everything that you need to understand about that object is all contained um, in, uh, in the same structure. Uh, in terms of versioning, so uh, this allows repositories to uh, make changes to objects over time and, and persist a history of those changes. Uh, there's a strong sense of this in OCFL as well. So the, the changes are tracked over time. Uh, every time you make a change, a new version is created. Um, but in an effort to avoid uh, uh, duplicating content uh, uh, when, when versioning occurs, uh, OCFL makes use of uh, uh, this concept called forward delta, meaning when you create a new version of an OCFL object, only the files that have actually changed between versions are um, stored in that new version directory. Uh, all, all of the files that have not changed are just stored in whatever version directory they're originally created in. And you can reconstruct that whole object just by using it, uh, a, a, again, in the inventory file that contains sort of the whole list of all of those versions. Um, and there's, there's a lot more detail here too. I'll have some links later, but uh, if you wanna explore the spec uh, in, in some detail, that's all online. Uh, storage diversity, and this isn't really a feature exactly, more just as, uh, again, this is just to make the point that uh, the OCFL really isn't uh, about any particular file system, any particular uh, media, R really it's just about how your content is laid out in whatever media you happen to use. So there's nothing preventing you from uh, using uh, cloud storage or uh, any other type of storage as long as there's some support for that kind of conventional metaphor of, of a structure of files and folders. Uh, and finally, completeness. I think this is uh, one of the important aspects that, that OCFL offers and something that we're pretty excited about on the Fedora side is just enabling a, a full rebuild of the repository just by reading in the, uh, the content in your storage media in that, in that OCFL format. Uh, and, and this is possible because the complete intellectual object is stored together with its metadata. And, and this is certainly in line with lots of uh, digital preservation uh, standards that are out there. Um, and you may be wondering why the OCFL exists if all these other standards already exist. And I think the, uh, the little block of text in the it, over to the side here is an attempt to explain that, that, that many of these standards do indeed talk about what you should do. Um, they, they don't often tell you how to do it. And, and the OCFL is an attempt to provide uh, instructions on how you can organize your content so that it is uh, not only compliant with some of these um, existing specifications, but uh, also gives you some of these additional benefits that I've just been uh, talking about here. So uh, from our perspective, in terms of what we get out of the OCFL by, by adding it to Fedora, uh, and this is somewhat of a, a summary of the above, um, really just this, this application independent persistence, uh, uh, as well as being able to rebuild the repository. Uh, we really think those things are quite important, particularly from a disaster recovery uh, uh, perspective. Um, certainly you never know what's going to happen. I think the fact that we're all living through a pandemic right now that no one was thinking about, or at least most people weren't thinking about even six months ago is, is itself pretty good uh, evidence that we ought to be thinking and being prepared for disasters, even if they seem unlikely. Um, and that's one of the things that the OCFL is trying to provide is that sort of long-term disaster preparedness. Um, on the migration side, and I, we think this is important as well, um, we're anticipating that migrations, particularly from earlier versions of Fedora, like Fedora 3, will be easier going into Fedora 6, um, largely because we can transform the data in place. So we, we can take the Fedora 3 data and transform it into Fedora 6 compliant OCFL data. And then after that, you don't actually need to run any kind of an import 
uh, you can actually just drop the Fedora 6 application on top of this converted data and have it read in that data the same way it would in a rebuild operation, uh, and then your repository is ready to go. Um, and if you want to see that in action, uh, we put out a YouTube video just a few weeks ago that demonstrates that. Um, and also, if you just pull down the latest code, you can, you can see that as well. Uh, but we're also anticipating fewer migrations in the future because future versions of Fedora uh, will be architected to work uh, and comply with the OCFL. So uh, maybe there might be some kind of transformation of data structures, but we, we don't anticipate a whole scale export import type uh, operation. Uh, instead of making the data conform to the application, our intent is to make the application conform to the data. Um, and uh, because migrations themselves are one of the main sources of uh, corruption and, and problems with um, uh, resources as we sort of move them in between systems and run all kinds of transformations on them. So the fewer migrations we do, the better. Uh, just to give you an idea of where the OCFL is, uh, and I should highlight because I haven't said this already, this isn't really a Fedora thing. Uh, we're using it and it, it kind of originated in the Fedora community. Uh, but as you'll see on the next slide, there are lots of other people interested in the OCFL. It happens to be something that we're implementing in Fedora, but the two are not intrinsically tied together. The OCFL really is its own effort. Um, and it's quite close to a 1.0 release. It's been in beta for um, almost a year now. Uh, and as you see on the right here, all of the criteria for a 1.0 release have already been met uh, in terms of uh, getting a validator in place, a test suite, fixture objects, et cetera. Um, and so there are a few kind of GitHub issues that are left to tick off a few things um, remaining, but uh, quite close to a, a 1.0 release. And if you're curious about the institutions that are uh, investing in OCFL right now, this is, this is not exhaustive, but just gives you a sense of the various uh, institutions that have uh, picked up OCFL and done something with it. And um, I'll, I'll provide a link to these slides so, so you can go back and check these out if you're interested in some of the uh, clients that have been developed, uh, test suites, validators, et cetera. But um, this isn't really in the context of Fedora. This is just sort of a community of tools and implementers that are, that are uh, making use of the specification and see it as valuable. Uh, so finally, I'll just talk a little bit about what we're doing with uh, Fedora uh, in the context of OCFL. So uh, Fedora 6, uh, we're working on it all through this year. Uh, we're running one week code sprints every month of the year. So we've already done a few of those and we tend to keep running them uh, each month throughout the year. Uh, we've been getting good participation, about four or five participants on each sprint, which is enough to, to move things forward. Uh, and of course, more folks are always welcome to join. Uh, whether it's for uh, development purposes or uh, testing, documentation, validation, any of those things are welcome. Um, we are working with pilot partners and this is an effort to make sure that we're kind of validating the process all along the way. Uh, each of these institutions is, is uh, attending the weekly tech calls and uh, uh, as we complete uh, features, they're uh, picking up the application and testing it out and validating it. Uh, they've already done a lot of uh, migration uh, uh, testing with their Fedora 3 data, which has been really useful. Um, and so our hope is that by the time we're ready to release Fedora 6, we've already done a lot of kind of validation and acceptance and, and gotten a lot of feedback and uh, done a lot of the necessary testing. So there's no surprises when we uh, release it to the broader community. Um, and of course, we're trying to send out regular videos and summaries of the sprint activities and we'd welcome um, feedback more broadly. Uh, and of course, none of this is possible without all the institutions that support us both financially uh, and within kind effort. And so I, I do want to take a, a moment just to say thank you to all of these institutions for their continued uh, contributions to Fedora. Uh, this is uh, the only way really that we can maintain full time staff in the project and uh, continue to uh, build and, and produce the software, uh, fix bugs and uh, address the, the, the needs of the community. So in terms of where we're at, um, we've implemented basic uh, resource management, so your, your CRUD functionality is, is in there along with versioning. Uh, so the repository is mostly functional at this point. Um, we do have an upgraded uh, migration utility uh, that does support the OCFL. So if you have Fedora 3 data, uh, you can right now uh, run a test to see what it would look like in Fedora 6. Um, and we, we do have the rebuild feature in place, so you, you can um, blow away your Fedora application and then kind of rebuild everything from the uh, from the contents on disk. And uh, we expect to be adding uh, more features uh, again over the next few weeks uh, and months. So there is code available now, um, and you can pull down the master branch of Fedora 6 if you want to see what that's like. Uh, the next sprint's at the beginning of June, uh, and uh, again, they'll be every month. Uh, we're anticipating a beta release this year, uh, and then if all goes well, um, ideally we're getting a released version out um, uh, sometime early next year.
Uh, but of course, a lot of that's just dependent on community contribution uh, and making sure folks are participating in the sprints and, and giving us uh, uh, feedback along the way. So lots of ways to get involved if you're interested. Um, there's some links here and I'll, I'll share the slides um, to the, the code sprints, the migration utility. Um, uh, of course, we have a, a Slack that you can uh, uh, participate in and, uh, and support us through the, uh, through the membership program. Uh, so that's just my contact information. Uh, I'm available if anyone has questions, um, if you want to follow up afterwards or anything like that. Um, I will try to take a look. Uh, I'll see if I can pull up the chat or the, the Q&A here to see if there are um, any questions. Uh, and if, if I'm not seeing them, uh, if someone could please let me know if there's a, a question, I'd, I'd be happy to answer those. There's a couple of questions, David. I can read them out to you if you'd like. That would be great, yeah. Sure. Um, one question says, which standards is OCFL consistent with? Yeah, so I put a couple on the slides uh, up here. Um, so uh, looking through some of, say, the uh, NDSA levels of preservation um, and uh, uh, the Trusted Digital Repository standards, and I wouldn't say that the OCFL is going to um, completely address all of the needs of those standards, more just that it's consistent with um, some of the, uh, the requirements of those digital preservation standards. So, so it hasn't been designed kind of, um, you know, it, uh, totally in isolation. I, I think we're paying attention to some of the other uh, requirements um, in the community. And, and I would certainly say too, if, if folks are aware of any digital preservation standards that we should also be paying attention to or, or any potential conflicts, um, the spec is still, not quite in a 1.0 release. I think we have good representation from the, the wider digital preservation community. Um, but if there are, uh, but if anyone isn't aware of, uh, of any issues that might uh, come up there, we'd, we'd, uh, certainly I think the editors would be happy to, uh, uh, to address those. And uh, there's another question here. Does mirroring intellectual structural metadata in the file storage ex um, slash export uh, structural metadata bring any issues or difficulties onto the file system storage uh, domain, I believe. Uh, I, I need to solve, for, for instance, do I need to solve, decide what complete intellectual item object, the, what complete, the complete intellectual object before storing it or saving it? Yeah, so sorry. Know. There's a lot packed in there. <laughs> you don't want to read that one. There's a, there's I, a bit packed in there, David. I, I did pack, pull up the Q&A. So yeah, let, let me just quickly read yeah. that and see if I can um, uh, understand what, what's being asked here. So does mirroring intellectual structural metadata in the file storage export structural metadata issues difficulties onto the file storage domain? So do I need to solve or decide what a complete intellectual item object is before saving the files for it? Um, so I, I'm... I'm not sure if I'm completely understanding the, the question, but I'll, I'll attempt um, uh, a bit of an answer here. If, if it's around, do I have to know the complete contents of an object before I hit the save button uh, or, or something like that? Um, the, the answer to that would be no. So you can kind of create um, kind of a, a, let's say you wanted to create an object in a, in a draft form and you knew you'd be adding content to it later. Um, that that's totally fine. Your initial the, the initial content that you added an object would create the first version, and then anything you additional you added later on would just be added as uh, the next version of that resource. Um, but it would still the total version history is still all stored in the inventory file. So from the client perspective, if you're viewing the object, you could be viewing the complete object in whatever kind of the, the latest state of it is, including all of the resources that you've added to it over time. But if you're sort of composing an object and, and committing it to the OCFL object at, at each point that you're adding something to it, you would just be creating a, a version history kind of along the way. So uh, ho hopefully that helps answer that question. If, if not, feel free to um, add more in, into the, the Q&A. But, but, but certainly you don't need to kind of have in your head the what the final state of that object would look like before you create it. And it looks like there's there's one more uh, final question here. It, if you uh, write files directly to the OCFL file structure instead of using the Fedora API, do you then need to do the rebuild? And is that a lengthy process? Yeah, so that's a good question too. And actually it, it's uh, pertinent because we're 
Uh, we're exploring this right now. Uh, we went to our uh, governance group to ask about uh, use cases. Uh, this is a use case that some have described as side loading, meaning again, as it's describing here, instead of writing through the API, you want to write content directly to the file structure in OCFL kind of underneath the Fedora API, uh, but still have Fedora be able to kind of read that content in and, and understand it. Uh, and, and I think uh, that functionality is not, uh, has not actually been finalized yet. And so if you have a specific use case there, uh, so if you have a use case for side loading, or if you have a use case for kind of writing content outside of the, the API, uh, I, we would be really interested to hear that, uh, but you could send me an email or participate in any of the communication channels because we, we don't want to add features that no one needs. We don't want to add complexity uh, based on sort of theoretical use cases. So we're trying to understand what the real needs of the community are. Um, but I, I would say we can, it, it's certainly possible for us to architect it in such a way that you would be able to kind of load content in outside of the API and have it not take forever for that to be updated. Um, but sort of the, the, the good news is that uh, we're not there yet. So if that's a real use case, we, we really would love to hear it um, and, and feel free to get in touch any, any way that makes sense. Um, because we would need people after we build in that kind of functionality to, to validate that it's doing what they what they want it to do as well. So so yeah, the answer there is if that's a real use case you have, I'd, I'd really encourage you to get in touch. Uh, we, we do think that there are others. Uh, we've been asking about it, and we, we do think others have those kinds of use cases. But uh, it's important for us to hear them. Thanks, David. Uh, with that, we're at time, and uh, I had inadvertently passed over one of our working groups uh, who we were trying to sneak in. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Jeremy. I'm going to load up his slide real quick. This is Jeremy Friesen on the Hyrex uh, Permissions Working Group. One moment. All right. <clears throat> Ooh, I hit the wrong button. Go ahead, Jeremy. All right. So this is a working group that has already closed out. There's the a URL to the closeout report. Um, the group started after Sam Vera Connect with a goal to design up some uh, improvements to the current permissions um, system for Hyrax. And there was a, a driver where there was some work being done for the Palmy Palsy um, grant by Notch 8. So we thought if we can get some more information to feed Notch 8 for when they do that work, then we might be able to um, really capitalize on some, some of the momentum of people focusing on these use cases. So the TLDR is we documented and further organized the use cases. We started some discussions into the design and found that Notch 8 had enough to proceed and that the energy we could then spend would be better focused elsewhere. So we collectively agreed that we should complete Valkyrie work before we work on permission work. <clears throat> That's it. Thanks, Jeremy. Yep. <clears throat> All right, let's stop the share real quick. And we're going to keep rolling forward with our presentations. Next up is uh, using an API ingest for Avalon. That's with Tim from WGBH. Thanks. Um, there we go. Excellent. Yeah, let me get to a point where I can share my screen. All right. All right. Thanks for having me on, everyone. Um, I don't know why I said that like I was on a radio show. I guess it's this uh, Zoom method. Um, so I'm relatively new at WGBH um, and I've been working with our developers, um, most of whom you know, um, on Avalon. Um, so 
I named this presentation or my kind of sub name is the road less traveled by. Um, and I think with uh, referring to Robert Frost's poem, um, but unlike Robert Frost, we, we attempted both roads before we decided on the one that was best for us. Um, and the reason being that when we initially looked at Avalon for our project, which was a NEH digitization project, um, digitizing um, tapes, we thought that uh, we want to use Avalon as is. Um, however, that setup differed than, you know, I think a lot of people use Avalon. Um, we were having files digitized by a third party vendor and then deposited on an S3 bucket. Um, we were doing the transcoding ourselves, so we, we didn't need Avalon for transcoding and we didn't need Avalon metadata from Active Encode running media info and FFmpeg. So if we didn't have files to ingest, you know, the question is like, why did we attempt this road? Um, and the main reason is, you know, we, we took this route because of the community and the level of support that was there. Um, and also our, our main goal was, you know, can we use Avalon as it exists? Um, so going that route, route um, the developers wrote custom transcoders. Um, we added additional fields that aren't available in the manifest ingest process. Um, we had to create a pre-manifest script that would check for collection presence and create if not found. Um, then we had to comment out stuff that verified the presence of files since we didn't actually have files. And all of this led to a point where we were starting to make um, changes to Avalon that were non-trivial and it was starting to mount up to a point where, you know, the, the cost of going this way was starting to outweigh the cost of customizing Avalon using API ingest. So then after all that work, we decided to take that route and that involved creating um, two active record database models to rep represent ingest and ingest, ingest item respectively. Um, let's see, my computer's lagging. Um, we also created custom poros for reading in manifest and mapping to the above models. There was a custom job for sending map data to ingest API. Um, and then some custom Avalon views borrowing from the collection views for the user interface. And if you can hear children singing in the background, I have a five-year-old and three-year-old outside my office. Um, and, you know, so, so the verdict for us was, you know, for a third-party digitization using the API, API ingest may be the best solution. Um, Henry Niels, one of our developers, you know, put it this way that, uh, you know, if our project was a car, we had initially built it for the road because the road was paved, but it turned out where we need to go was off-road. Um, and we're still in the process of um, modifying Avalon for our needs where, you know, we're in the, I don't know, I'd say still early, well, maybe we're in the mid stages of it. Um, and that is all I have for today. Um, if there's any questions, I know that uh, um, Drew is in chat and can help answer those. We definitely have some time for some questions. So uh, we'll leave it open for a couple of minutes while folks formulate. To, uh, Tim, I have, I have one question. What what system were you all coming from at WGBH uh, when you moved over to Avalon? Uh, we didn't have a system in place. Or this was a, a new project.
wait just a couple more seconds. Thanks a lot, Tim. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks. All right, we're a bit ahead of schedule, but uh, I think it's probably a good idea to just keep moving forward. Um, oh, Karen actually just jumped in with an answer to my question. Uh, she said that they were using uh, FileMaker for metadata management and they had been using an old DAM system called Artesia but then abandoned it. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump onto relevancy and the creation of shared meaning. And that's uh, Max Cadell over at DCE. Um, Max, yeah, I believe you're muted. I want to back up and. Sorry, double mute buttons. All <laughs> right. So uh, thanks for the intro, David. Uh, I'm Max Cadel. Um, I work at Data Curation Experts, and I'm a developer there. Um, the projects I'm going to be talking about today are ones that Data Curation Experts worked with um, the Emory team on at Emory University. Uh, we had a pair of projects, uh, Curate, uh, which is the staff-facing repository, which its code name is Curate, uh, surprisingly enough, and it's based on Hyrax. Uh, and then uh, the Emory Digital Collections, which is the public-facing discovery tool for the content in the staff-facing repository. Uh, and that uh, project's code name is Lux, and it's based on Blacklight. Uh, so the first thing I want to address is what is relevancy? What are we talking about when we talk about relevancy? Uh, so the first big point is that it is what is included in as well as what is excluded from search results. So that can include what's being searched, what fields are being searched, what fields are not being searched, um, completeness, so precision versus recall. And a good example I thought of this is um, are we trying is this for like a law case, uh, a legal case? Um, are we trying to get every single time uh, a, a person's name has been mentioned in a case? Or is this something like, uh, so for that legal case, you would want um, everything to be recalled? Um, or is this reader advisory where like too many answers is gonna be really confusing for our reader and we really wanna scope it in to just the few most relevant, most pertinent things for that particular uh, individual. Um, another thing uh, is, are we defaulting to or searching or are we defaulting to and searching, uh, which is gonna affect what's included and what's excluded from our results. So here we just have a, a this is probably familiar to y'all, but uh, on the left, we have an or search using the double pipe. So you'll see we have 206 results uh, for our search for barber or dog. Uh, and on the right side, we have, in this case, our default search, which is barber dog, which defaults to an and search. So we're only getting two results in this case. Uh, so what's going to be most useful for uh, your users is going to depend. Are your users uh, more likely to be on the lawyer side, on the legal side, and need every single time uh, these words occurred, uh, or do they only want a more tightly scoped set of answers? The other, another big part of relevancy is how are those search results ranked? So what is at the top of your results? What's at the bottom of your results? What's on page one versus what's on page five, which uh, studies show most people will never get to. Um, which fields are given more weight, uh, which ones are de-emphasized. Uh, and the other really important part of relevancy that I wanna talk about is that it's dependent on the specific user's needs. 
Um, it's impossible to have your relevancy fit every single possible user's needs. Even if you know a lot about your users, even if you have a really specific user base, um, you're not going to fit everyone's needs. Um, and if you can be aware of unconscious bias, both within yourself and within your systems, that can help you make better decisions for your users. Um, so I had meaning in the title of, of my talk and in my abstract, so I'm not gonna do that thing where you don't talk about what's uh, on the box. So what uh, makes meaning? So in this case, our meaning is our results and relevancy or an aspect, the, the kind of output of our meaning. So one aspect of that is what search terms uh, does our user put in? And we don't have a lot of control over that. We can try and educate, we can try and share um, how people can um, interact with our uh, application we don't have a lot of control over this. Uh, another aspect is our search interface. And in this case, our Lux team was uh, working on our user-facing search interface. So that can include, where is your search box? Um, what options do you give? What are your um, uh, targeted fields? Uh, then you also have your solar query. Um, in our case, we had this, these paired applications and we could actually have different solar queries in our um, user-facing interface versus our staff-facing interface. So in this case, we're talking about the Lux team's work on the solar query. Uh, you also have the solar index, which was created and populated with by the curate team, the staff-facing team, uh, as well as the catalogers or metadata librarians. And then you have the object description uh, which is created by our catalogers or metadata specialists. So we're talking about a user. I figure I'm a user, I'm a human. So who is our human? Our human is Max. Um, Max has identities like any human. Some of my identities include I'm white, I'm educated, I'm not disabled, I'm queer, uh, Everything is okay, but one of our systems has an alert, um, which is that sound you just heard. Okay, uh, I'm queer, I'm a trans man, I'm from the US, I'm not an immigrant, I am documented, I have lots of other identities, many of which probably don't even occur to me as identities. Um, some, are, some of these are more marked, some of them are more privileged, some of them are uh, disprivileged. Um, as a human, I have research interests. I have a background in music and musicology. Uh, I'm especially interested in intersections of gender, masculinity, race, uh, the prison industrial uh, complex. Um, and so I just thought I'd show some example searches. So I'm a musician, I'm interested in instruments. What do we have um, in our collection for instruments? So some of these are relevant to my search. Some of them are literal musical instruments. Some of them are images of instruments. Uh, and some of them are 18 piece urethral instrument sets uh, because our collection includes medical artifacts as well as uh, a very large collection of images um, both of African-Americans and about African-Americans and African-American uh, life in the US. So this is just an example of how I, as a user, think I'm being really clear. And I have one conception of what the word instrument means and what I'm looking for when I say that. Uh, and what's in our collection is not always going to match up with that, even though it's perfectly reasonable to call to, for um, a urethral instrument set to come up as an as a early result for that type search. Um, another research interest of mine is QD Leadbetter, AKA Leadbelly. Um, and so we have some images of Leadbelly. Um, all of these are really relevant to my search. They're very tightly scoped. Um, I don't have any irrelevant 
uh, um, answers to my query. Um, but one thing that I find interesting, a lot of times when I'm doing research, I'll click on a record and then I'll see what subject terms come up and I'll kind of continue to follow those subject terms. So here I have a nice display of, of different subjects. Uh, but one thing I'm particularly interested in in my research interest is um, both who are the musicians who's performing and kind of like in this talk, who is the audience? What is the music being performed and who is hearing, who's listening? Because that's part of how the musical experience, the meaning of the musical experience is created. Um, so in this case, we have uh, a mostly white audience uh, listening to mostly African-American performers. Um, there's a white performer over here just out of frame. So although the race of our musicians is cataloged and marked and, and in the subject headings. Um, the race of our audience is not. The race of Woody Guthrie, who's a, a white performer, is not marked. So if I'm trying to, as a researcher, get at the interactions between groups uh, to understand better um, that meaning making, uh, I can't really get at the, that using how this has been cataloged. Um, so I'm coming up on time. So I just want to talk about some levers that we have uh, as developers or as catalogers and how we can talk about them with each other. So one thing that's really important and that was really important in this project was a relevancy test suite uh, because that uh, lets you find out, it allows rec replicability and observability of results and ranking. Um, and it also, it gives you sanity checks and, it, and it, it means you can see what have, if I've changed something, has it actually changed my results? And over time, you can figure out what's going on. Um, another lever, as I mentioned, was is the search interface. What are your fielded search choices? Um, what can a user sort by? What can they limit by? Um, you can use solar tuning in your solar query. So you can either boost or unboost uh, certain fields. So if you're getting a lot of uh, full text results that are not super relevant, you could bring down your abstract here um, and sorry, and raise your keywords or your topics. Um, so that brings us again to the solar index. So what is included and what is not included. Um, and your object description. So this is sort of the idea of what are you considering the default and what is the unmarked subject or uh, who are we assuming the user is um, and should that be made explicit? Um, so I have a couple more examples, but I'll leave those for now. Um, I have some further reading. Um, this idea of how do we create meaning, how do we uh, interact to understand things is, is partially coming from my reading of Tom Torino and Percy and Semiotics. Um, and the, the concept of um, the unmarked or the default uh, being often being the dominant group um, and that that can kind of uh, reinscribe um, racism in um, our discussions and, and so forth comes from Bell Hooks's writing. So I just want to um, give a shout out to her. Uh, so I think that's what I have and open the questions if there are any. Thanks, Max. That was a, a great presentation. I I, I think I had said earlier, I, I need those slides. I, I had said, in fact, I've been trying to explain that to some of those concepts to folks for a while. That was wonderful. Uh, but we'll leave the mic open while folks are formulating uh, some questions. All right, we have one up in the Q&A. If, if uh, you want to read it, I'll, I can read it out to you, though. Um, this one comes and says, uh, what was the process for developing the relevancy test suite? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I actually have another set of slides that gives some more um, specifics on that. The first step is to uh, start off with direct interaction with the system and the collection. Um, so, and I would suggest doing what I just discussed using yourself as a user um, and, uh, and kind of, especially if it has anything to do with your, your actual research interests or your interests, poke around, see what happens, see if it's, notice whether it's what you expect or what you don't expect. Um, and then our next step was to use RSpec to test against our collections directly um, and to see like, all right, if I search for the, the phrase civil rights, how many responses do I get? Uh, is it, uh, do, does it include the responses I expect? So uh, one thing we tested for in this uh, civil rights spec was uh, is Martin Luther King Jr. in the first page of results because we found that that was the current behavior and that's also what we would expect from this particular collection. Um, a thing that we found somewhat odd was um, that this Joseph Pogani object um, was the first result for civil rights. Um, and I think I had never heard of him as the founder of the American Civil Rights Movement, and um, he, he was not, um, spoiler. Uh, but part of why this object uh, was first in our search results was because this object uh, had the full transcription of the text. And so the, the phrase civil rights occurred many times in this example. Um, so you could test against this current behavior and then um, build out, you can make changes and see, all right, does it move that particular object down in our search results? But then what happens to our Martin Luther King? Is he still on the first page or has he moved to a second or third page? Uh, and is that what I want? Or is that what my, my users need? Um, and you can also, we also did a little test of this in JMeter as well. So that's another way to look at, okay, how many results am I getting for specific phrases or specific searches? Um, am I getting around the right number of results? Um, I believe Stanford has a pretty thoroughly built out test suite that has a lot of um, options in it. So what we did for this application was really just kind of a, a starter pack because they're, they're in beta release and they're just getting started on their journey. Um, I see another question from Rebecca Pat Patillo, um, or sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, which says, Max, there's quite a bit of discussion around whiteness, white supremacy within metadata in the archival field and how to mitigate best practices surrounding metadata creation. Happy to share if you're not already familiar with them. I guess that's not a question, um, but yes, I'm, I'm very interested in that. And I know that, it, I know that it's a larger discussion. Um, I actually have a, a background, it's been a while, but a background in metadata and part of uh, what I was excited about was thinking about how can developers work um, in conjunction with those folks in metadata and archival to make sure that their, their work on decentering whiteness um, and uh, decolonizing the library ca catalog or decolonizing the archive is then brought forward um, in the developer's work of presenting that material and making access it accessible to the public. Thanks. Um, th thanks, Max. I think we're at, we're at time there. Uh, so there, of course, the channel's open. If there's more questions, this is a big topic, uh, for sure, um, and one that I'm deeply interested in as well. So, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna peel off here and pass the mic over to Brian McBride. Uh, many of you may be aware that Sam Vera Connect 2020 uh, will not be an in-person uh, meeting this year. So there's some, some updates about uh, uh, fr from the Sam Vera Connect planning committee, uh, as well as uh, an open discussion. So we hope you can all uh, take part in it. Brian, when you're ready.
Thanks, David. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, Brad. Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just wanted to provide the community with some updates uh, pertaining to Sembrera Connect 2020. Um, unfortunately, as David mentioned, we won't be having an in-person meeting in beautiful Santa Barbara uh, this year um, due to COVID and some other considerations. We um, It was decided not to have the in-person meeting. Um, I did want to take a moment to extend um, our many thanks to the folks at UC Santa Barbara for all the work that they've done putting together um, all the, the legwork. Um, it's no small task and we really want to extend our thanks for them for um, everything they've done. The good news, uh, we will have an online meeting this fall. Um, we think it's really, really important to ensure that we keep the Connect Conference going. Um, there will be some changes this year and being that it's primarily held, it will be held online. Um, so. I'm sorry, Brian, to, I'm sorry to interrupt, Brian. I, uh, we are looking not at your presentation mode one, uh, but just at the presentation. I'm not sure if you didn't click presentation mode or if you, if you have two screens. So, oh, so there's sorry. two. Yeah, thank you, David. Let me see if I can draw the presentation. Sorry to interrupt. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. So just wanted to give some um, history about Connect for those of who, who haven't been able to attend in the past, um, just so we can sort of start the discussion. So historically, Connect was started in 2014, I believe. Uh, it was an in-person event. It was It's constructed. Um, into a single track and for one day, uh, which is typically the plenary session, which is attended by everyone. There's a later in the day, there's a poster session. Um, and last year we had lightning talks on the same day. Um, the other days of the event are multi-track where we have presentations. Um, there's usually at least three tracks, sometimes four. Um, there's workshops that are multi-tracked, um, morning sessions, PM sessions. Um, there's also a multi-track unconference. Um, and along with the actual Connect proper, we have associated events, um, one being a partners meeting and the other one being the Developers Congress. Um, we've also traditionally had um, a room or space reserved as a hack space where people can get together and work on projects or just get together um, and discuss um, work that needs to be done over the, the upcoming year. Um, so the plan for Connect 2020, um, we've had our initial meetings, we've met three times as the program committee. Um, we're sort of discussing what uh, possibilities there are. Um, we've talked about what other conferences have done, specifically CNI, how they've adapted their in-person meeting to an online event that is spread over multiple weeks. Um, and also the library publishing forum that's um, gone from in-person to online. The things that we have to consider is that those organizations didn't have much time to prepare to convert their conference to an online format. However, we do have a pretty substantial amount of time to give consideration to what we want to do for Connect 2020. Um, some of the things that we discussed as a program committee is um, it's really, really important for us to get together as a community. Um, given there's a lot of things that happen at Connect um, in person in terms of networking, building the community, mentoring, um, a lot of these important things that we're going to try to recreate online. Um, the thing that we want to also ensure is we, we have an amazing event for an amazing community. I think it's we always hear um, from newcomers and just uh, people who have been in the community for years just how amazing um, the community is with helping other institutions um, and really just trying to do the best to ensuring we're um, helping the organization's mission and helping the community. Um, with, on that, it's sort of creating opportunities for breakout sessions. That's one feedback that we get all the time is how much actual work uh, takes place during Connect and how much how much the projects uh, move forward. Um, so we're going to try to ensure that we try to um, make that happen again this year. And um, sort of wrapping that part up is um, 
as unfortunate as that we're not going to be meeting in Santa Barbara this year, um, and it is also an opportunity for us to think about things differently um, and to try out new things. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind is um, we're open to new ideas, new suggestions um, with this. So the initial ideas the program committee came up with, um, the first is we're tentatively thinking that this will probably be a two week event. Um, each day will be no longer than four hours. Um, that's important because um, historically um, folks have attended connect from at least eight time zones. So just like we do with virtual connect, we're gonna make sure that we provide a, um, a period each day um, that helps um, allows for as many people to attend as possible. Um, we talked about doing live presentations or workshops with Q&A, um, also the possibility for pre-recorded um, events with then a scheduled live question and answer. Um, one, the other thing we're trying to do is based on the history of Connect is trying to recreate the components in all environments. So that would be workshops. Uh, we're reach, we've talked with some folks who've done workshops in the past, not everyone. Uh, watch out for your emails. Um, we'll probably be reaching out to you soon. Is the feasibility on doing online workshops? Um, so we're looking into that um, since that's something I'm not sure any of us have um, done, but. The next thing would be presentations, which I think we're all done a great job of virtual connect this year. So that's something we're pretty comfortable with. Uh, again, lightning talks, uh, poster session, um, young conference and the hack space. Um, so we we reached out to folks at, um, who organized other conferences and there seemed to be some differing opinions on um, some conferences focused a lot of effort on social gatherings, um, both before and after the sessions, and sort of talked about, um, given the, the broad range of people who are in time zones, um, specific time zones, uh, specific gatherings based on time zones. Um, so we think that social gatherings are really, really important. I know there's been a lot of um, the, the evening dinners um, are very productive and people enjoy those, uh, the Women Technology Group. Um, so we're, we're thinking that those are very good things to um, invest resources and time in, um, but we'll be asking some questions later in this presentation. Um, and just getting input from the community for new ideas. We have a really talented group of the program committee, but um, we want to get feedback from everyone in terms of, you know, what do you think would be good? Have you heard some new ideas about what other conferences um, have done online that they um, Want, we should be considering doing for Connect. Um, just some considerations um, that we have for Connect. Uh, again, some variants from at least eight time zones, and this is a minimum. Um, I'm not sure what the data is for virtual Connect, but that might be even more time zones. Um, resourcing, we have to be mindful of. Um, it's putting on a full um, conference online. We'll probably have to discuss staffing and platforms. Um, so there might be um, calls out to the community. Um, challenges to converting an in-person conference to online. Um, we're going to be navigating this all together. So um, again, we'll probably be reaching out to the community, um, again, for guidance or support. Um, and important, too, is accessibility, uh, making sure that um, we can you know, reach a broad audience, make sure everything's done in a proper way. So uh, we're gonna do some live polling. John's gonna push out some questions uh, in just a moment. Um, and there they are. So um, if you wanna go with me or go at your own speed, um, we changed this up this morning. So the purpose of these questions are to get input. We have some of our own personal opinions on what's important and based on historical data, but we thought this would be a really good opportunity to poll people at Virtual Connect to see which components they really want to see at Connect, which is now virtual. Um, so the first one would be, do you find the workshops useful? Um, again, that's a three option scale, yes, no, abstain. Um, give everyone a second to consider that. Um, do you find the plenary session useful? Um, next one, the, do you find the poster session useful? Again, the same scale. Uh, do you find the presentations useful? Uh, 
Again, lightning talks. Uh, the unconference component useful. And again, for those who may not have attended um, Connect in the past, the unconference is um, user generated presentations or discussions. Um, so everybody puts in a proposal, then we have an application that uh, is called Sessionizer that then organizes the unconference component the day before. Uh, a question, what would you add to Connect 2020 virtual conference if there were no limitations? Um, you can answer in the chat window or email the um, email listed below. Again, we're looking for anything and anything big, small, um, really interested to see what people's uh, opinions are, ideas. So I'll leave that email address up there for a second. And again, we'll be sending out um, as part of the Virtual Connect survey, some of these questions, and there'll be a couple of additional questions added afterwards. Uh, so Connect is attended by people from across the globe. We're planning on making the events uh, take place during a three hour time window to ensure everyone has a chance to attend. With that in mind, how long should Connect be? Uh, so the options would be one to three days, four to six, and seven to 10. Uh, next question, would you be willing to volunteer for being a room captain? Um, again, room captains in the past, um, they helped manage time and helped manage um, questions that people had. Um, so it'd be expecting to be a somewhat similar role. Um, for... uh, would you be willing to ask a friend or colleague to join the event? Uh, we're always looking for um, trying to ex get the awareness of the community out there. And if people are interested, be, invite them. Um, to connect, and especially this year, there's um, less barriers, so there's no travel required. Um, so, and we do have one question. Um, could you just talk about what the responsibilities would be for a room captain? That would help people answer. Of course. I mean, since we're still sort of planning, we're, we're still in the pre-planning process. Um, our expectation would be the room captain would be something similar to. Um, what uh, David's been doing and others um, just help facilitate Q&A um, for the presenters um, and maybe doing some minimal uh, tech support um, and just reaching out with the presenters and stuff like that and just um, some basic coordination. But again, this could change depending on um, moving forward, but that's where we're sort of thinking at the moment. Um, the next question, are you interested in organized social gatherings, coffee hours? Um, um, All right, did everybody have a chance to answer the survey? Okay. Um, so I know you're asking yourselves, how can we help out with Connect 2020? Um, some important things that we would uh, be helpful is engage with the program community. We're gonna be sending out a lot of emails um, over the summer um, and giving updates. Um, so just active communication uh, would be great. Um, volunteer to be a presenter. Again, um, what really makes Connect possible is everyone who um, is willing to present on the work they're doing, um, hosting workshops. Um, it's really driven by the community. Um, the committee just does a lot of organization, but it's the presenters. It's um, everyone here that really makes Connect take place. 
Um, so again, I know things are different this year, but um, in the past, we've had a pretty um, solid uh, representation of presenters um, to fill out the program. And we're, we hope that this, uh, this year is the case as well. Um, and it was something we've done in the past and gets really great feedback is volunteer to be a mentor. Um, we're not exactly sure how this will look, but in past years, we've paired folks up, uh, new, new members of the community with folks who've been in the community for a while to do um, introductions, um, help them you know, steer themselves around the community, understand the software, um, vote, introduce them to people in the community. Um, the next one would be propose new ideas. Um, that's really important. I think, again, what I said earlier about opportunities, um, we have an opportunity here to propose new things that uh, we could possibly incorporate into Connect in the future. Um, so yeah, any, any ideas, we'll review them all. Uh, we'd appreciate um, any submissions. Um, and again, volunteering um, as new opportunities arise, this is um, important. I think there's a little bit more, um, we're gonna need a few more volunteers this year. Um, to make this happen. So just uh, watch this and bear a listserv for any calls. Um, and now for just the general questions and answers. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Um, again, if you don't feel uh, you wanna ask them now, there's the email um, address up there on the screen. So please feel free to submit any questions by email as well. Thanks, Please. Brian. We can uh, leave, the, leave the mics open here for a few more minutes as we formulate questions. And I should call out that there are a ton of great ideas already populating in the Virtual Excellent. Connect 2020 Slack channel. That's great to hear. Excellent. I think uh, I won't see any questions coming in unless I'm missing them. If one of my co-conspirators can call me out if I'm missing some questions that are coming in. I see someone is, is still typing in the channel. I'll wait one more moment. Just, just to thank you uh, from Ann, and I think that's I'm sure coming from all of us. I know it's coming from me as well. Um, thanks for keeping St. Bear Connect going even during these difficult times. It's a huge undertaking, I'm sure. And so thank you to you and the team. Thanks. Yeah, and I, and I just want to take a moment to um, recognize everybody on the program committee. You know, uh, Richard Green, um, he's uh, been great over all the years. I know he's uh, thinking of retiring. I hope he doesn't. Um, Richard's on the line. Uh, I just want to go through, you know, Abigail, Elliot, Jeremy, Nabila, Kevin, and you, David. And I just want to extend my personal thanks um, for everyone's work that have done so far and uh, for the work to come. So that's all I have. Excellent. I think with that, um, we just completed San Bear Virtual Connect 2020. Thanks, everybody uh, in attendance. We had uh, great numbers at one point over 130 I, I saw pop up um, so that's that's wonderful attendance thank you all it's uh, it's been a great experience uh, running it and um, like we said earlier we had a, a wonderful team I want to give applause to everybody who helped out um, so and including all of you who were able to present and take part in this wonderful exchange of ideas and thoughts it's what keeps this community moving uh, do my co-chairs or any other members of the community want to say anything, go ahead. Yeah, just want to echo that and thank you very much. And, and thank you also for sticking with us um, through a tough start and um, for being here for your kind words, um, 
for the um, lovely um, sentiments that have been going through on um, Slack and for, for sharing that with, with Notch 8 as well. And we'll be in touch for a couple of the talks that were um, either postponed and, and see if maybe we can't reschedule those and share those at a later date. So um, yeah, on, on behalf of the uh, program committee for uh, Sanvera Virtual Connect, uh, thank you all so much for being here.